We're never early. <laughs> oh, hi. We're early today. <laughs> One hi, minute. Everybody. What, what? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Coming to hi. you live. One minute early for the first time in Peace of Christ history ever, virtual or in person. <laughs> For real, no joke. Remember, remember when we'd meet in person and we just, <laughs> so we'd always remember something like right when it was supposed to start, just some like chaotic thing we needed to do or forgot about or something. Kind of a rush. Yes. Always down from. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello to everybody signing on. We are going to get going with a few announcements, although we are still a minute early. It's still 9.59 on my watch. So I'm going to wait a few minutes for people to sign on. It's so funny because when we sign on late, like usual, like 10.03 or something, 25 people like, bam, but it's only five right now. <laughs> like Nobody expects us to actually sign on early. It's all us. Oh, we're up to seven, but it really, I'm pretty sure it's the seven of us. <laughs> so, hey, David. <laughs> Saw ya. Hi, Tiffany. Good morning to everybody. I'll just go ahead and say, as usual, that the link is pinned in the guide for you. I mean, that the, the guide is, wait, how do, the link to the guide is pinned in the comments. <laughs> so yeah, you can pull those up. On your I think David was trying to say something. Yeah. It, you're, is that David breaking up? I think it was, yeah. David, you're frozen and I'm muting you because I can hear, wait. What is that? Do you hear that? But he's Yeah, muting. I hear it too. I don't know, but he's frozen. It sounds like a child. It's funny because <laughs> he's frozen mid-sip. <laughs> Someone took a screenshot. <laughs> okay, as we're figuring that out, hello to people. Hi, Lyle, Lee, Mark, Larry. Oh, thanks for saying hi. Larry is always joining us, even as he has his own community to lead on Sundays and every day. But um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue sharing announcements. Link to guide. Thanks. Prayer requests. <laughs> We're dropping a link for prayer requests in the comments right now as well. That, that won't be pinned because we can only pin one, but please click on that link and then later go back to it and share your life update or your prayer request with us. And we will send those out on Monday for the whole community to hold space for what you're going through. It's been a very, very crazy week for all of us. And a lot of people are still suffering. So we um, just want to acknowledge that. And I also, I'm going to share in the, the um, in the, here, I'm gonna, hold on. in the comments. This is a link for donating. I know that a lot of people have texted me asking about places to donate to. And I've also wanted to don make donations. And this link that I just put in the comments will um, have a list of, all kinds of organizations that are doing relief work right now in the Austin area, San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, like all the majors. Um, you can see the donation links. You can see their cash app and Venmo handles. Like it's just a kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of good work happening. So share that with all your people who are expressing concern. And of course, if you'd like to make a donation, that's a good place to go if you haven't already. Good morning, Tammy and Jeff in Kiana. And Trey and Paul, lots of people. Yeah, okay. hey y'all. <laughs> yeah, there you are. <laughs> um, also, I'm about to drop another link. It's Link Central over here. Our monthly homeroom gathering right after this uh, service where we will go into Zoom and we will just chit chat. We will break up into some rooms. So you can chit chat with smaller groups and then do, it a, do another round of that. And we'll just talk together and just have some community and conversation time. We did it last month and everybody was really into it. And we had a lot of great feedback. So please come into that space. I think you need to register. So go ahead and click on it and get registered so you get the link. Um, we would love to see you right after this and chat with you. 
Okay, what else? Communion Tori's elements. Here. Sorry, I just said Tori's here. Hi, Tori. Oh. <laughs> Whoa, it's like showing me. It's just going crazy. Okay, so guide link, communion elements, grab your communion elements, homeroom. Okay, y'all, I'm dropping one more. <laughs> I'm dropping one more link because I want you all to go and register for the workshop that we're having next month. It's just in a few weeks. Um, it is called Will the Real Apostle Paul Please Stand Up? Our friends of peace, Reverend Natalie Webb, who's also the co-founder of the Nevertheless She Preach Conference. Um, she is a Pauline scholar finishing up her PhD work in all things Paul, and she wants us to get together, actually we asked her, <laughs> and talk about um, the redemption of Paul and how actually he's a really cool guy and there's lots of reasons to like him apparently. Um, and so yeah, register for that, it's free and it's just a one night thing and we're looking forward to it. Okay. Can I just say I am looking forward to that because I don't always love Paul. And I think Paul has been hijacked by a lot of contemporary theology that acts like it is the theology and it's only maybe like 50 or a hundred years old or whatever. So. I, that is exactly why we're doing this workshop because a lot of us feel have, have some uh, feelings, feel some type of way <laughs> about Paul. And <laughs> Natalie is really, she's the perfect person to engage those questions and to give us a fresh take on <laughs> it's something that she sees as always having been there. Um, and so really excited about that. Again, it's free and we're just excited that she was willing to donate her time to be with us. I think it's March 15th. Okay, so I think those are all the little announcements. I'm happy to see everyone's logged on. We have a little, um, a little, I guess, segment that we're doing during Lent called Lenten Lessons. And I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Okay, so basically we want to invite you in this space of the chiming to reflect on your previous week or your current moment, the present season that you find yourself in. We are in the season of Lent. This is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent began on Wednesday. And um, we wanna invite you during Lenten lessons and the chiming of the hour to share a Lent lesson or a Lenten insight with us in the comments. So I'm inviting you to do that now, whatever it may be, whatever comes, we will compile some of those and we will read them the end of the gathering, right before the benediction, as just a collective point of solidarity as we travel this Lenten road together. So I am going to chime the hour, I ask you to share those in the comments. All right, uh, please continue to share in the comments. I'm not sure if what's going on there, but please feel free to share as we continue into our space for uh, the kids moment, the kids message. And if you are a bit of peace, I would love for you to gather around your computer screen or your TV or wherever you are, gather around because we have a little lesson just for you today. And I'm going to do a screen share.
And I'm also going to, I lied. Sorry, I lied to your parents, but I didn't mean to, it was an accident. I'm gonna put one more link into the, uh, into the comments right now. And this is a Lenten calendar. Of course, you can Google these and find any of them, but this is the one that I like to print out. And I'm also gonna show it to you on the screen. So let me get that screen share going real quick. And let's talk a minute today about the season. Okay, let me make sure you can see it. Is it gonna pop up? Can y'all see it? Okay, there we go. All right, so you may or may not know that today is the first Sunday in a very, very special season in the church. It is called the season of Lent. And we started Lent on Wednesday. And Lent is a 40-day journey to Easter Sunday. It's a really special season because everybody decides together to acknowledge it. It's only special because we make it special. And so one way you can observe Lent and learn about it is by following a Lenten calendar. I like to print this one, my daughter Cozy, and we will color in each day, like every morning or whenever we think about it, we'll color in the space with a crayon and we'll kind of watch the journey unfold as we head to Easter. And um, if you, the reason I like this calendar is because if you don't have a printer at home, you can very easily draw your own. So this one shows you how easy it is to just sort of draw a squiggle line, draw a path, and write in the numbers. But I wanted to tell you just a teeny little bit about Lent in case you didn't already know. During Lent, we make space in our lives to experience God in a deeper way. So even though God is always already with us, Lent is a special time where we all decide together to make extra space to think about God every day. And this thinking about God and making space for God every day helps us prepare for how wonderful Easter is. I know a lot of you love Easter because you probably get candy. You probably get to have Easter egg hunts. Maybe you even get a new outfit or something to dress up all cutesy in. I don't know, but Easter can be a really fun time because it's an exciting holiday. And Lent is really, really important because it helps us remember why Easter is so important. We'll talk about Easter later. Today, we're going to just talk about Lent. You may notice that even though there are 40 days in Lent, you can see here on the calendar that the Sundays aren't counted in those 40 days. You can see the first Sunday, and then you go a little further and you can see the second and the third. There are six Sundays in Lent, and we don't count those as a part of our 40 days because the church likes to remember Easter every single Sunday. We call these Sundays little Easters. They're little moments where we remember Jesus. We remember Jesus rising again, and we pause from our Lenten fasting, which is another way to talk about Lent, and we think about Easter for a moment. And so this is a little bit of a break, but it helps us to stay focused on our ultimate goal, which is counting down to Easter and making space for God along the way. So if any of you kids have any questions, you can ask your parents or you can ask your parents to ask me or Matthew or Fran. We would love to answer your questions. But the main thing is that I would love for you to have a calendar. So can you ask your uh, family to help you print a calendar or to help you draw a calendar. And then we can check in with each other on Sundays and we can see the calendar colored in and you can think about the ways each day that you're making space for God. So I'm so excited to have this journey with you. It's just the beginning, but I know Easter will be here before we know it.
It's my turn, right? Turning on original sound, but I'm going to talk first before I turn on original sound. So, hey, you guys, um, this year for Lent, I'm doing a little thing that's a little bit out of my ordinary, um, and it's for me, and it's also for you. Um, because part of our business here, around here at Peace, is that we try to come to a more mystical place so that we can go look backwards and look forwards both and draw elements from the ancient traditions of our faith practice and faith tradition and bring them into the now. And so that also we can look, we can look forward. And so we're, um, for that, we are often singing music and liturgy that's from both, that's from the now and that's from ancient traditions. So one thing that I'm gonna do this year in Lent is um, bring us some ancient song liturgy, some elements of liturgy that, um, that aren't normally a part of our um, services. But today I wanna to bring us the Sanctus. And um, Sanctus simply means holy and it is a very ancient part of Christian rites and masses. And um, the traditionally, um, it is placed inside the Eucharistic liturgy as a as part of the preface prayer to communion to the Eucharist. And um, for a while, I um, worked for a local Episcopalian church playing music for their evening services every Sunday, and I would play this particular version of the Sanctus every week. It is sung every week. And um, I've included the text in the guide. So if you want to pull up the guide and hang out with the text for a minute, there are two parts to the Sanctus. There's the Sanctus and, um, and the, the blessed, it's the, the Sanctus is the holy, holy, holy part. And the other part is the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord part, which we know these are scriptural references, right? Holy, holy, holy comes from the account and revelations of the angels sitting around the throne of God and singing perpetual praises to God. And then the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord comes, I think from Psalm 118, but also then we were going to reference it again in the liturgy of the Palms. Palm Sunday, which is the week before Easter, right? So I want to start and end Lent this year with a singing of the Sanctus. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sing it one time through. It's pretty simple, this arrangement is. Um, and then I'm going to sing it a second time through in hopes that maybe you've caught on a bit and that you're able to follow along with the, the, the lyrics. The these are just an English, particular English translation of the traditional Latin um, text. So I hope that sounds as fun for you as it does for me. Um, that's my business. I'm into this this thing, this melding ancient and new traditions. And here's a here's a little caveat that I just want to offer. Um, I'm pretty convinced that you know, looking at the life of Christ, that His purpose in appearing on the earth wasn't like to get us to worship Him. I think, and this is me. Okay, my theological take is that he wanted us to wake up to the presence of the kingdom of God and the community of heaven and to the fact that we have the we have access to the divine and all the divine resources in, both within us and in all the earth. So if you have if you have deconstructed and you have a little bit of trouble with this like um, worship, very traditional worshipy language. I invite you to do a reframe because remember, we're coming into a more mystic place, a place where we can draw things in and integrate them in fresh ways that serve us and that are useful to us. So I invite you, if you have trouble with it, to reframe this as an affirmation, as an affirmation of both the divine as we experience the divine in the world and the divine as the divine exists and lives and thrives within our very being, okay? So if you need that little reframe, I invite you to just do that little quick switch. So here we go. We're gonna sing this on the Sanctus. Um, please sing along once you catch the drift of it. And again, we'll sing it again on Palm Sunday later in, in Lent. So here it is. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Lord, we 
and peace nicks <clears throat> i have been having a little bit of trouble with my internet this morning so i hope you can all hear and see me okay good that's exciting i hope that you have not heard or seen a word of what has been going on my I am doing the service this morning, and uh, it's one of my favorite things to do. It's one of my, when, when we started coming to peace, it was one of my favorite <clears throat> elements of the service. Uh, I grew up Catholic and, and doing uh, communion every week and went to a Southern Baptist church uh, where we did it maybe a couple times a year. Uh, ended up working in a church where we actually did it once a month, and I loved that, enjoyed it, and Back to a church where we did it, you know, maybe a couple times a year and, and then finding myself at the peace where um, not only was it a regular practice, but it was an intentional practice and, and being able to participate in that. The, the, the few times I was able to before we uh, went digital was, was really uh, refreshing for me. And the thing that stuck out to me most about the way we practice communion was that we do use the language and the tradition of an open table and coming from places where that was not done and, and uh, where that was a large reason that we were looking for a new faith community uh, was was very important to me and, and then this week with the just absolute insanity of what has gone on with weather and power and water uh, we probably like some of you uh, had had food that went bad, uh, you know, from our fridge or our freezer. We ended up, you know, saving some of it in the snow and things like that, uh, you know. And, and you know, we've got renter's insurance, and so we we put some put put a put a claim in for that, getting some getting some cash to get some of that food replaced. It's exciting stuff. But when I, when I think about the open table that we share, and I think about the people all over the state, and 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 not just our state. There's there's plenty of people all over. That are that are experiencing similar conditions that don't or won't have food, and 
the ex the the expectation that I, I have a child coming to me. I see you, baby. Thank you so much. Yeah, go go play with Bubba Bro 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 Sissy. Um, <clears throat> I did know that Hillary would be working when I agreed to do this, and it normally works out. Today, my children are very <clears throat> unique. I apologize. Um, I think about the open table that we share, and it is open to those of us who maybe identify or, or have a more traditional or what we would consider normal standing in place in our culture and in our society. But that also means that it's open to uh, our brothers and sisters and our she's, he's and they's and people who identify in, in different um, genders and sexualities and people from interfaith communities and, and people from uh, different socioeconomic realities within our community. And it's a table that, that Christ brings to us to provide that that food that gives life and brings life. My my element today is going to be a, a peanut and this this GT's uh, mystic mango kombucha and <clears throat> I enjoy kombucha. It, it makes me feel nice in my tummy. Um, but what I think about is the people this morning uh, around me who, who may not be participating in a communion ritual, um, but but who also may not have food. Um, and and that 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 thought has been with me all week, and have followed and and tried to promote several of the mutual aid organizations uh, that that um, that, I, that I've seen in that post and, and others, uh, and and so I I don't know where I'm going. I'm going to stop rambling now. Um, I didn't write anything down. I I thought about this just in my head and, and wanted to talk about the open table and how much I appreciate that being a part of the peace of Christ community. So if you will join me in the liturgy of communion, it is in your worship guide. Uh, I'll read the, the, uh, the, the italicized and, and you'll read the bold text with me. And then I'll share a communion prayer. We will partake in our elements. So uh, if you want to grab those, I would do that. Um, and then I will close our uh, liturgy of communion. So uh, if you will speak with me, the Lord be with you. And also, and also with you, lift up our hearts. We, we lift, lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to it give our thanks. Thanks and, and praise. <clears throat> the table of bread is now made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more and you who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time and you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. <clears throat> Loving God, through your goodness, we have these elements to offer, which have come from the earth and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing, so that we may bring your, so that we may know your touch and presence in all things. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his community through the centuries and shares with us now, made one in Christ and one with each other. We offer these gifts and with them ourselves, a single living act of praise. Amen. I've got mine here. And if you will close the liturgy of communion with me, still in your worship guide, <clears throat> as great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ come, again. come again. Amen. I am so sorry. It's okay. <laughs>
it is more than okay. We, I know how it feels, of course, having a little one to feel the flustered and to feel a little bit on edge, but as all of us receiving it, we have, first of all, so much compassion for you, but also we delight in your kids. We hope you delight in ours. We're used to it and it's, it's holy noise to us. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'm so excited to move into a deeper look. I can't ever decide if communion or a deeper look is my favorite. I love them both so much, but i um, excited to introduce you to one of our wise women of our congregation, one of our um, church mamas, if you will. <laughs> this is Joyce. And Joyce, I would love it if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Um, well, I am a retired teacher. I taught speech, language arts, reading, journalism. Um, began with high school, but ended up spending years in the seventh and eighth grade. So those, those ended up being my favorite young people, I guess, because um, I don't know, there's just, I, that's probably, I think I heard someone say before that, that may be where I am intellectually or mentally, emotionally. <laughs> that's my where I am in life is I'm a 12 or 13 year old perpetually, um, but I really identified with them. Um, let's see, we moved here about three years ago from Mississippi and I moved here because my son moved his family about six years before that to Austin, far like a 12 hour drive away or from our little Gulfport airport, it was like a four or five hour flight. So we wanted to get closer. Um, so that's where we came and we started looking for a CBF church that had things that our church had had that we were leaving that we had loved, inclusive, um, loving and deeply thoughtful. And that's <laughs> how we landed with you all. You met all of that and uh, wonderful music as well. So that was another plus. Um, so, and then Forrest and Maya began coming to the church, which was just something I did not anticipate happening, which I have loved getting to be in the same church with them. Um, so that's my family. I have, well, I mean, I have sister siblings and I have parents who live, in fact, my family is spread out in four states. So I'm really looking forward to getting that second vaccine. So maybe I can go and visit some of them, you know, who I haven't seen in over a year in person. Um, that's, the surface things, I don't know if you want to know hobbies, likes, interests, I guess, the deeper stuff. <laughs> okay. um, I love to read. I always have like two or three books going at one time. Um, really into YA fiction right now because I have a dream of finishing a YA novel that I've been working on for years. <laughs> so I've joined some classes and some writing groups, to, you know, I'm taking some classes and I've joined some writing groups to kind of help push me along and get it done. Um, I like feeding my birds, uh, planting herbs in my little raised bed garden, playing with my little, I'm, not, I'm like my little cat's playmate. Only, I, think we, I think you always need two cats because they need a playmate. But anyway, my little cat has been my playmate for a year. Um, let's see. I, I'm a political junkie. I read my news feeds. I um, if, have lots of opinions on political things. Just ask and you'll find out. <laughs> Let me get a long answer. <laughs> um, let's see. I've been doing a lot of anti-racism work for the last year. I think the pandemic was my time to sit the feet of brown, you know, brown and black authors and just learn. And my eyes are perpetually open now. I am forever aware of systemic racism and can't unsee it. How it's been in our history from day one and still here today. Um, and let's see, I love, okay, <clears throat> fun stuff. <clears throat> I love baking with my granddaughter. She and I spend a lot of time together. I get to see her at least once a week. I go and pick her up after school. Sometimes she stays with me and we always bake something. Um, we, have, we aspire to be on the show Nailed It <laughs> one day as a grandmother, granddaughter uh, duo. And we have our in for the show because we have actually baked sugar cookies and forgot to add the sugar. So that's gonna be our, <laughs> our way to get into the show. Um, okay, that's me. 
I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And all of your dreaming is so inspiring, reminding us that we dream our whole lives long. And I love that so much. Um, okay. Yeah, we've got a request that you always be on a deeper look every week. I love that idea. We could do a series on Joyce, like a five week series. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Joyce, tell us some quirks about you. What are some things that no one would know unless you told them? I'm going to be shorter. Um, I Two things, I think. One, I talk to my plants. <laughs> um, when I am, uh, if I overwater, underwater, and one of them dies, I'm quick to apologize. Um, I tell them I'm cutting you back, giving you another chance to make it. You know, I'm moving you into this bigger pot because you need it. Um, you know, if somebody saw me, they might think I'm either close to nature or a little nutty, but, you know, they're like living beings to me, so I communicate with them. That's a weird thing, I guess. Um, and I tend to hum a lot and sing to myself, but it's always the same little clip from the song, so I drive David crazy. It's like, can you move to another song he wants to tell me? <laughs> You've done that one enough. So those are my quirks. Love it. Love that so much. I think we're going to have some plant, some plant comments, some people that resonate with that a lot. I know Jana, Jana's in here. So she's up here, up in here resonating um, for sure. Okay. Here's your not so bonus question. Cause I accidentally pasted it in the group panel. <laughs> I'm so choice was able to see it, but it's probably for the best. What is one thing about your practice of faith today that would horrify yourself of 20 years ago? Okay, two things. One connects to what David was saying about the open table. Oh, I grew up with such, I mean, almost fear clouding the communion table as if, you know, you know, you couldn't partake if you were unworthy in any way. And, you know, as somebody who tended to feel unworthy a lot, it was always a difficult time for me. You know, I uh, turned that inward lens and thought, gosh, I'm not worthy of this. But I began, I started, I went to a church that began to preach, you know, the open table. And I heard of a woman who actually came to Jesus by being invited to an open table. And my whole it, a communion became one of the most beautiful parts of service to me now. And our concept of this is the table of Jesus and it's full and it's there for you and everybody um, would have horrified me 25 years ago. It would have been like, there's no way that's possible. Um, and then through this church, I am becoming more and more comfortable with the feminine divine. That is, and, and I needed it. I needed that nurturing to be part of my understanding of God. And so those are two things like using the pronoun she would have just like, you know, I would have been looking for the lightning, you know. <laughs> okay, that's it. Thank you for sharing. That's a great answers. And I think probably if, well, most people resonate with one or all of those. Um, okay, on the other side, on the other side of that question is our final question, which is what are you particularly passionate about right now in your spiritual journey? Um, I don't know, I seem to be working in pairs today. Um, the um, Enneagram is, has been a wonderful tool because especially this year, I mean, you know, we have, to, and since I've retired, I mean, I, I defined myself by my roles in life, I think a lot. I don't know if a lot, I became a mother young. I, um, so it was wife, mother, teacher, but since retiring, it's been like, I've been spending a lot of time with myself and sometimes it's not comfortable. You know, I can look at myself and see the flaws, the regrets, the, but the Enneagram too is teaching me there is a shadow side. There is a healthy side. There is your striving towards growth, towards a, a more healthy you. You know, and Father Roar's teachings have taught me, get to know that shadow self, be comfortable with it. Give grace to that self. Um, so I think that is, it's a, it's a good tool for me to learn more about myself and to help myself grow. Uh, the other thing is contemplative prayer. Um, I began hearing about this. And now if I can spend 20 minutes with the same words going through my mind and just listening, that is, um, I get past all of my angst, all of my preconceived notions of God. And I'm there in 
feels like I'm in the presence. It's very healing. And so those are two things that I think are working for me right now and helping me out. So. Thank you, Joy. So much wisdom in your own journey and your lessons. You're always sharing with us. And I just want to say like one, one time you said something to me, I never forgot. I even wrote it down. And uh, it, I think it was a quote directly from you. So you, you said to me, perfection is the enemy of the good and just fine. <laughs> I guess this is another bonus question. Sorry. Do you want to say anything about that? Because that, that really helped me. And then I wrote it down and it's just so, so, so good. Well, I, don't, I wasn't the first to say it. I know, I, I, but you know, I did add the just fine because I mean, honestly, you can tear yourself, you can tie yourself into knots and get nothing done and nothing accomplished if you're thinking perfection only. And just get yourself out there and be, have grace for yourself be just, and just fine amazingly works <laughs> so many times. Yes, love it so much. And everyone has been blessed by your words today. Thank you for being vulnerable with us and sharing uh, about you. And uh, we'll just go ahead and give it to Jana now. We'll move on. Thank you. I have to follow Joyce. Gosh, that's a hard task. Uh, if you'll join me today for the reading, um, we're reading from Isaiah 58. I'm going to be reading from the uh, Common English Bible, the Women's Bible. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 58, 1 through 5. Shout loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their crime, to the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day, desiring knowledge of my ways like a nation that acted righteously, that didn't abandon their God. They ask me for righteous judgments, wanting to be close to God. Why do we fast? And don't you see? Why afflict ourselves if you don't notice? Yet on your fast day, you do whatever you want and oppress all of your workers. You quarrel and brawl, and then you fast. You hit each other violently with your fist. You shouldn't fast if you're doing as you are doing today, if you want to make your voice heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I choose? A day of self-affliction, of bending one's head like a reed and then lying down in mourning and clothing and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? We hear the voice of God through these words. Thanks be to God. Um, first of all, really, I don't record this part. You know, the way Janet just read that, I just want to say, like, what is this? A fast for ants? Okay. <laughs> Secondly, I'm just so glad to be with you all. Um, it feels good to to see you, it feels, our irreverence in the Facebook comments feels good. For some reason that's comforting to me and it feels like our community is together in some ways. And um, and I'm actually missing seeing some people on, on uh, engaging us on there because I know that they're still struggling to recover. Uh, they're fighting through the recovery of this past week. So um, so I, I, miss, I miss you all. Um, so it, we have begun Lent. Really, you can start recording now if you haven't yet. We have begun uh, Lent, and this past week was Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of the Lenten season. And as we observe Lent in our various ways uh, for these next 40 days or so, our sermons are speaking from the theme of showing up, meaning we are exploring what it means to show up to life, to show up in, in the just fine, as Mama Joyce says, to show up to the realities of our world, to bring our full, beautiful selves into relationship with others and bring the full weight of our beauty and who we are, the full weight of that to bear on the world around us. And Lynn is often understood as a time to remove things from your life, but we're offering, it's also a time to show up and be present to your world. The little bit of church that I participated in while I was growing up, it was mostly in Pentecostal and evangelical context here and there. I didn't do much church. It just wasn't part of, of my growing up. So I didn't observe Lent, didn't really even know what it was until I was part of this community. Uh, I'm a learner alongside all of you. 
And one of my first Ash Wednesdays corresponded with a trip to the dentist, my like biannual trip to the dentist, which is something I usually dread because I never know what surprises await me there, even though I do floss every night. Thank you very much. But on that Ash Wednesday at the dentist, they're scraping and they're grinding on my teeth and I know you all hate to if you don't hate to hear this you're crazy. Uh, it served as a good reminder for my own mortality and shortcomings and 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 as I was trying to figure out what Lent was that kind of felt appropriate. This kind of memento mori remember your own death, but as time goes on i'm moving away from self flagellation or dentist induced flagellation for Lent and i'm thinking more and more about the additive practices that can help me show up for others. Jana just read the first half of our of our text where, where God says, what is this, a, a fast for ants? And basically what's going on is the people are asking God, why, why is it that we keep reaching out to you with piety and prayers and fasting? And the response that we keep getting back from you, God, is new number, who dis? And so the prophet explains to them what true fasting is. Let me read that for you. Beginning in verse 6, picking up where Jana left off, the prophet writes, Is this not the kind of fasting that I have chosen, says God, to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to put clothes on them and not to turn away from your own fellow human, your neighbor, your own flesh and blood? And if you do that, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will guard you in all directions. Then you will call and I will answer the phone. You will cry for help and I will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always, will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. Listen to this infrastructure plan. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets, with dwellings. We hear the voice of God in the reading of these beautiful words. Thanks be to God. Now, first, if you're looking for a Lenten practice, you know, for this season, something to add to your life, you might just consider memorizing this bit of the Bible. <laughs> it is really fantastic right there. You can do it. It's 12 verses. You got 40 days. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. You got this. But if you need some help understanding just how fantastic this bit of the Bible is, uh, think about the context. Let me just explain the context for a minute. This part of the book of Isaiah was written to the residents of Jerusalem, that famous city, that age-old city, who were, they were returning from forced deportations. They were returning from this forced exile. They were returning from this forced government relocation program. And like us in many ways, this speaks to us today, they were at this key point in their history where they were trying to rebuild their society, their social, political, religious, and economic systems. Sixty years prior to this, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he laid siege to and he conquered Jerusalem because the king of Jerusalem flip-flopped from being on Team Babylon to being on Team Egypt. These were the two superpowers of the day. And if, if you know your Hebrew Bible history, you know Jerusalem must have been in a tough spot if they went over to Team Egypt, right? 
you know the story of slavery in Egypt, the book of Exodus, the plagues, all of that. And Jerusalem said, we want to be on that team. So the, Bab the Babylonians didn't like this. And in response, they, they came in and they completely destroyed Jerusalem, just to the ground, the city, the temple, the walls, everything. And those who survived went through a series of deportations over the next decade, just waves of the Babylonians coming back and taking away more people, taking away more people and scattering them all over. Uh, and so the, the, the Babylonians knew if you can uproot a people, if you can keep a people from feeling settled and established, if you can keep them from building physical, spiritual and cultural infrastructure, they are a lot easier to control. And I think about this a lot when I hear people being told or when I hear them say that they have to be uprooted from their communities if they want to be successful in life. I think, oh my goodness, no, you're missing out on so much. So 60 years later, the Babylonians, then they were conquered by the Persians and the new administration told the Jews, you can go back to Jerusalem now. Uh, in reality, they probably thought this would promote empire stability. Uh, empire is going to empire. It's what it does. So some of the Jews went back to Jerusalem. Now, in my mind, here's where this gets really interesting. Can you imagine the social and the economic dynamics of all this? Maybe some of those who were allowed to stay behind, who didn't get forcibly removed from the land, maybe they, they came in and they filled that vacuum of power and commerce and they found a way to flourish while others suffered. Maybe some of them who stayed behind had stolen land and houses after the violent deportations, just like people did when Jews were taken away during the Holocaust. And just like Poland to this day continues to be the only EU country that has not passed a law to help Holocaust survivors reclaim the stolen property, the residents who stayed behind in Jerusalem may have been unwilling or unsure of how to equitably return stolen land and houses. I can pick on Poland, I can pick on Jerusalem of that day, but the United States, of course, we're just as bad or we're worse because we bear the same guilt this day. We've never really made amends or reparations for not one, but for two violent forced deportations and cultural genocides. How do we begin to make amends for this? It's amazing how this text will speak to us and to our culture even today, our situation today. Maybe some of those returning to Jerusalem, they were returning in utter poverty, having only the clothes on their backs, while others did really well in exile and they acquired wealth or prestige in Babylon. You know the story probably of the four young Jewish men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they were chosen to be a part of the king's court. People like this probably didn't return empty handed. In fact, they may have been sent back with the political and the financial blessing of the empire that was sending them back to Jerusalem. Imagine all that and imagine all the innumerable other social and economic dynamics that were present at these, as these exiles are coming back to rebuild their society. Imagine in the air, the feelings of hope and grief and guilt, anger and excitement. Imagine the uncertainty. How long until the next empire comes along and destroys our infrastructure and dismantles our community? How long until that happens? What do we do with those who have suffered the most because of these empires? How do we live as a faithful community in a world where the powers that be, they don't want us forming a critical mass of showing up. They don't want us forming a body. They don't want us forming a community of empowerment, of life-giving power to one another. These are the questions that they were probably wrestling with. And to be honest, these are perennial questions. These are the questions that apply to us today as well. And it could be said that they were in the midst of repairing the soul of their society, the soul of their society. 
we tend to think of soul in very individualistic terms, don't we? And, and, and we only think of individual souls and getting them saved, whatever that means. It usually means something about getting a person to say the right words, to believe the right things, and to behave, and then maybe one day they'll belong. But I like the definition of soul that the theologian Bruce Rogers Vaughn uses. I, I put it in your guide today. His definition of soul uh, is that soul is that fabric that embeds every one of us within all that is. Soul is our existence within the woven living web of all humanity and creation. <laughs> this is soul. In other words, the state of one's soul has less to do with saying some words, and it has more to do with how well one is woven into a healthy, life-giving community with God and with their fellow humans and with the rest of creation. And I, I one of my New Year's goals this year is, is, is radical honesty, and so I've been trying to at least have one thing, one idea, one point in a sermon that can get me fired each week. Uh, and so this might be it right here, so pay attention. For me, the state of one's soul has less to do with keeping moral purity codes, like don't drink whiskey, and don't say cuss words, and don't live in committed mutual relationships with people of the same sex, and, and you better say you believe this doctrine about the Bible, or the Trinity, or hell, or whatever. You know, I, I don't think that stuff matters. I don't care about your metaphysics about what you believe about hell or about the Bible or about the Trinity. That stuff doesn't matter to me. The theologian Martin Luther said one of the definitions of sin was being in a state of being curved inward, which makes these forms of morality, in my mind, incredibly sinful because their focus is entirely on themselves. It's individually focused. It's curved inward morality. Hashtag irony. Which is why I find it helpful to think about the state of one's soul in more relational and communal terms. It has more to do with being a part of a community that promotes wholeness, that promotes physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, relational, financial health. It has more to do with access to resources like clean water, healthcare, food, electricity, education. In our text of Isaiah 58, God is confronting the people with this. You, you say you're doing all the right spiritual things like fasting and praying, but you completely miss the point. You are inwardly curved. You are oblivious to the burdens of those around you. If you notice, the text keeps using this one word, repeating it again and again, and it's the word yoke, Y-O-K-E, yoke. It's that, that farm tool that you would put around an ox so it can pull something heavy. And in the Bible, it is the universal symbol of oppression. And, 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 and it's intended to have this shock factor and effect to it. It should make us go, why is a human wearing something that belongs on a farm animal as if they are a tool to be used or an object to be owned? And to this point, God says, this is real praying and fasting and real religion. Untie the cords of the yoke that you have put on your fellow human. Set the oppressed free. Don't just untie the yoke. He says, break the yoke break every chain of injustice, and then satisfy the needs of the oppressed. And then look what happens if you do all that, that yoke removal. And I'm not making this up. I, I, didn't, I didn't choose this text at the last minute. Aurelian friend, no, I chose this text maybe a month ago to preach for today. But it says, if you will do that, then you will rebuild your society's infrastructure. Isn't that incredible? It says, you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up your foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. In other words, you will make your city and your home habitable once again. Here they are at the outset of rebuilding their society. And God says, if you really want to rebuild it, 
Stop oppressing one another and you will flourish. If you really want to rebuild your society, start by making sure that no one is treated like an animal or a commodity or expendable. If you really want to rebuild your society and get God's blessing on it, then make sure that the most vulnerable are not exploited and forgotten and oppressed as you build your systems and your infrastructure. This text could have just as easily been written to us today. You know, you know what we've been through this past week here in Texas. And this is a great place as we're thinking about Lent this year. Over the past year, uh, including last week, there has been an incredible unmasking and unveiling of what our society is and our systems. And as Joyce said earlier, this is one of those things that you can't unsee. We have seen how so many in our society are wearing the yoke of debt and resource deprivation and financial insecurity and underemployment and incredibly expensive housing, healthcare, education, and childcare. We have seen the yoke of loneliness on one another. We have seen the yoke of despair. We have seen the yoke of stigmatization, of needing mental health support. These are all yokes around our necks. And we saw this week how our leaders yoked hundreds of thousands of people with no electricity in single digit temperatures because it was decided somewhere along the way that they weren't worth the investment to ensure access to water and to heat. And now we find ourselves collectively positioned to have a conversation about infrastructure as a society. And I ask, will we choose pious words and prayers or will we remove the once hidden but now obvious yoke of oppression from people's necks? Will we build systems that promote resilience and health for the most vulnerable in our society, aka the not rich, the not mega corporations, the not downtown parking garages that don't need lights and electricity in the middle of the night? Who are we going to look after? Will we argue over ways to mitigate the yokes that are weighing down and exploiting people? Or will we find ways to completely remove them? God doesn't say mitigate the yokes on, on your fellow human. God says break the yokes that are on them. We love to mitigate exploitation and suffering rather than solve it. For example, rather than abolishing homelessness, we mitigate it with temporary shelters and due process in eviction court rather than abolishing war in which civilians, mostly women and children, disproportionately suffer, we just mitigate it with just war theory and detached drone strikes. Rather than abolishing extreme economic insecurity, we just mitigate it by saying, here, you can work three jobs in this gig economy. And guess what? Now it takes, statistics that our studies have shown, it takes 53 weeks of full-time employment to pay for 52 weeks of living expenses. Does anybody else see a problem here? Yeah, there's only 52 weeks a year, but you have to work 53 weeks just to pay the minimum living expenses for 52 weeks. Rather than abolishing malnourishment in our society, we mitigate it by saying, hey, breastfeeding women, you can stay on WIC until your baby is one year old. Rather than abolishing debt slavery and breaking that yoke, we just, we mitigate it via student loans and payday loans and title loans and bankruptcy court. I could go on and on, but the point is that God challenges his people at the outset of rebuilding their society. Find a way to break the yoke, abolish the yoke. Don't just mitigate them. God says, remove them. This is first principles thinking. And if, if we will do these things, we will actually show up and we will restore our physical and spiritual infrastructure. We will mend and strengthen the communal fabric in which we all exist. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Like many of you, I'm sure you're like, hey, Matthew, that's, yes, I'm passionate about that. I'm excited about that. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. 
I can't address life at that level. <laughs> I, I get overwhelmed as I think about mending our social fabric at such a grand level. I'm right there with you. I know a few people who get to do that kind of work. I, I think of George in this community who is helping to restructure healthcare in our entire society. I mean, like, like I know a few people that get to work at that level, but most of us, the level that we get to really work at is the family, work, church, neighbor level. That's where we really get to do this work of mending the, the fabric of our society. This is where we get to really show up. This is where we can show up and not just mitigate the yokes that are on our neighbors, but we can work to break the yokes. What would it look like? So this is my Lenten challenge. What would it look like for you to spend Lent looking for opportunities to show up and mend the soulful fabric at those levels, at, at the family level, in your home, at the work level, in your church, at the neighbor level. I, I, I was fortunate to experience this last night. My neighbor across the street, uh, he, they just came back in from out of town and, and he texted me and said, we brought some groceries. We were driving in from a different state, so we brought some groceries. Can I bring you some bread? And he brought me over a loaf of bread. He, he is mending that fabric of soul that we exist in together. I know, I know we all want to implement grand solutions, but I think for most of us, the best we can do is show up and look for how those around us are bearing the yoke of suffering, bearing the yoke of anxiety, bearing the yoke of loneliness or hunger, and we can attend to that around us. I was very impressed. I was very impressed with how this community, the community of peace, showed up and tended to the, so, the social fabric that is our community of peace this past week. I hope you were encouraged by that too. This was our time to shine, and I really thought we did. We, we listened deeply to one another's needs and concerns and fears and anxieties, and we found ways to take care of one another. We dropped off food and firewood and water. We took each other into our homes. Sometimes the most we could do was just provide emotional and spiritual support from afar. That was the most we could do, even in our own suffering and anxiety. But you know what? That was the bread of life that sustained one another, that sustained this community. That was the fire of life that warmed our hearts and our homes. It, that was the coming together to cover one another's bare shoulders with the fabric of sacred community. We did that. We showed up. We took care of one another. We mended and tended to that social fabric of soul in which we all exist. This was, I would say, the kind of true fasting that our Bible tells us to practice. And I think we're getting pretty good at it. This was our time to shine, and I thought we did. Now, this isn't supposed to be entirely self-congratulating. There's a little bit of that there. Good job. You know, that's part of it. But I think we're ready to level up. Peace community, we're ready to level up. Don't get intimidated by that. I want you to take it as a challenge to find one more person in your life who is bearing the yoke of suffering. One person bearing the yoke of suffering. And find a way to weave them into the soulful fabric of life-giving community. And as you do this, as you step into this challenge during Lent, as you show up and just find one person bearing a yoke and weave them in, I offer you the blessing that our text that God offers through the prophet to the community as they are rebuilding a society. I offer you the same blessing. May your light rise in the darkness. May your night become like noon. May our God guide you always, satisfy your needs, strengthen your body, and make you like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. I'm Tracy Henneke, and I'm going to lead us in the litany in just a moment, but I'm, I'm going to have to go back and listen to those words, Matthew. There were so many things in that message. Thank you for that. I think coming into a Lenten season, I've been processing a lot about what am I going to do internally, um, and I think that this is a good reminder that soul work is not just internal, um, and that it, there are so so many opportunities around us thinking about the last year, the last week um, that we have to, to come together. And, and there's freedom in that for me, that soul work is not only my own. Um, so thank you. And I look forward to doing that with you all. So if you will now join me in the litany for the wilderness, you'll find in your guide. God, as Christ goes out into the wilderness, to experience solitude, experience solitude, to refrain from distraction, to, to be tempted to escape, to, to be tempted find, to so we find ourselves at times in a similar place, whether we, whether we to go there or, there or not. Hear all the voices we rely on, whether we chose are, to go there or not. Are to tell us what to do next, to validate, to validate. are all far away. We only ourselves in the divine presence. We are tempted to sidestep suffering. We are tempted, we are tempted to blame to our pain, pain on other, on other people. people. We are tempted to run away before the work is done. We are tempted to know ourselves outside, outside influences. influences. But Christ has shown us the pathway, pathway of our true calling. It's through the desert experience, through the lonely, through the lonely places. We can only heal the world's suffering when we, when have, we have explored our own. own. Christ suffered once for all. For the, for the righteous, the righteous and, the and the unrighteous. And Christ offers to us this making of meaning so that we can find our way to joy. Therefore, in the season of Lent, we devote ourselves to self-examination, to rituals of purification and cleansing, and to focus on the essence of Christ in us. We ask for the help of all the angels and, and the support and presence of your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Matthew, as always, a very thoughtful and helpful word for our community in these times. I wanted to close with our benediction, and before I did that, with just a few of the Lenten responses that were shared, um, we got a lot, and we're kind of over on time, so I'm just going to share a few, but thank you so much to everybody. Please continue to think about where you are in this season of Lent so that, um, you know, next week you can continue to share with the community your process and your experience. Um, uh, Fran said this year in Lent, I'm fasting from a particular every week consistently since 2015, writing liturgy, giving my soil a chance to lie fallow and be renewed in creative resilience. Thank you, Fran. Tammy said, what are we giving up and what are we taking away? I have given over, uh, I am taking up peace, love and harmony, mindfulness of the moment. Thank you, Tammy. Jana said, I am using this season as a time of integration, a time of letting things that have been churned and disrupted of the last year settle in, intentionally recognizing and normalizing the changes and growth that have occurred. Thank you, Jana. And finally, Twyla said, trying to let go of the idea of control over my emotions and surrendering them instead. And in the same vein, taking up the creative mind of Christ to guide, to guide me, my process and emotions 
and actions. Thank you so much. I'm going to read the benediction now. And of course, feel free to join me um, in home room right after this. The link is in the comments. You'll have to do a little register to get the link, but please come join us. We'll be in there until the noon hour. We are. Um, but feel free to join me now, leaders, uh, for the benediction. And if you're at home, you can participate as well through the guide. Lord, you are ascending God. You sent your word to create. You sent Christ to reveal. You sent your spirit to empower. You sent your church to proclaim. Send us, O oh God, to renew the earth. Lead us by your spirit and your word. As your people, we now go. By our love, we'll make you known. People of God, you are sent. Go in peace for peace.